Hello, I'm Dr. Tess Laurie, and welcome to Tess Talks. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Sarah Myhill. Uh, Sarah is a naturopathic physician. She's been practicing in Wales, United Kingdom for many, many years, and she's registered with the General Naturopathic Council. I'm going to be speaking with Sarah today about how to restore good health. And as an expert in ME and chronic fatigue syndrome, I know that she's going to really um, be a, a great guest um, to share her views on this. So, Sarah, you're very welcome. Thank you, Tess. How are you? how are you today? And how's Wales? Fine, thank you. Actually, it's rather nice here at the moment. The sun is shining, so all is good. Wonderful. Uh, Sarah, actually, before we start talking about, about, about good health, I wanted to just, if you could just briefly touch on why you um, deregistered with the General Medical Council and, and you registered with the Naturopathic Council. Okay. Well, um, I qualified in 1981 and I've spent four, four decades uh, working either in general practice, either at the NHS or as an independent doctor. The reason I went to work as an independent doctor was because the NHS did not give me the clinical freedoms that I needed to be a good doctor. The word doctor, it comes from the um, Latin docere, to teach. And my view is I should be teaching my patients how to cure themselves because there simply aren't enough doctors to go around because doctors are not looking for disease causation. They are not asking the question why. Why does this patient have this symptom, this disease or whatever? And um, so much modern medicine is all about symptom suppression with drugs. Doctors are not looking um, for causation. And um, so I became an independent doctor in 2000 asking the question why. For many people, this is called functional medicine or ecological medicine or naturopathic medicine. It doesn't matter. It's all about looking at root causes of disease. And um, uh, as a res- when I went to into a, become an independent doctor, the General Medical Council did not like that. And they pursued me endlessly with um, concerns that I wasn't treating people in a conventional way. Um, the current score is um, um, an investigation is, is my hill 38 GMC nil. And in the end, I just got fed up. I just got bored with this because it's very time consuming fighting the GMC. So now I work as a naturopathic physician. I don't have the GMC on my back. I now have the proper freedoms that I need to be a good and effective doctor. Do you, do you think this is um, limited to the UK, this perspective? Because the UK has the NHS, the National Health Service, and, and all most doctors work within that system. No, this is a work well, this is a worldwide phenomenon where big pharma prevails because the education of doctors has now been taken over by the pharmaceutical industry and reduced medicines to simple algorithms of symptom drug that suppresses that symptom um, uh, is a short-term gain, long-term pain. And um, I think in third world countries, probably the standard of medicine is far higher than here. And I learned so much from talking from uh, Chinese doctors who who practice traditional Chinese medicine, from Indian doctors who use Ayurvedic techniques or whatever, because they are really asking the right question. Why is this person ill? This person wants to know why. And we have given the tools of the trade so that they can heal themselves by natural techniques. It's far more intellectually satisfying, much more fun. And of course, you really cure patients instead of, you know, symptoms suppressing, you're actually curing them. And you know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I don't think there's any question that we are actually at the absolute peak of, of uh, poor health. In, in in the world and it's in the UK and in the world, humanity has never been quite so unhealthy with chronic diseases. I mean, so many young people on medications. I mean, everybody's on medication. So many people on antidepressants um, and uh, and anxiolytics and and then and so so much diabetes and obesity, uh, heart disease, cancers. So we're definitely not doing things right, um, and uh, we need to, to really take a good look at, at and, and an, adopt a new approach and get back to health and, and restore our good health because uh, it's not too late for anybody, is it? 
So no, that, that, absolutely. That's that's what I say to you. Know, it might be a long journey, but it's never too late to take the first step. And you know, the body is brilliant at healing and repair itself. But if you, but the body has to have the raw materials, the energy, the time, uh, and the inclination. And yes, it can uh, it can heal itself. And many of these disease processes um, can be reversed. And the shameful thing is, it's it's the doctors who have the training, the intellect. They should be leading the way, and they're not. Presently, doctors are leading us to, as you rightly describe, um, uh, an epidemic of chronic disease. So, Sarah, tell us your approach. Tell us how can we restore good health from whatever uh, place, from whatever our starting point? Okay. Well, we have to ask the question, why? You know, how did we get there? And there are two common threads that come up time and time and time in most disease processes. One is all about energy delivery mechanisms. Now, if I could give somebody infinite energy, they would have all the energy they needed to do things physically, do things mentally, do things emotionally, emotionally, you know, they could achieve much. But we are restricted by the energy that the body can generate. And of course, I've learned this through my patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So the first thing I always look at are energy delivery mechanisms. And in parallel with that, Another major reason for ill health is inflammation. And inflammation um, arises when the immune system is busy. So you have to ask, why is the immune system busy? Is that for reasons of allergy, for reasons of autoimmunity, or for reasons of chronic infection? And we're currently seeing epidemics of inflammatory conditions because of the wretched vaccine, the COVID vaccine, we know that is very good at switching on inflammation. And what goes in parallel with inflammation is clotting. And um, and so much of the, the issues uh, surrounding COVID vaccines can be explained by those mechanisms. But I always start off with energy delivery mechanisms. So let's uh, go through that quickly. The analogy that I like to use that all my patients get and I get is the car analogy. And for your car to go well, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank. You've got to have the mitochondrial engine. And that's my special area of interest. I've published three papers about this with respect to fatigue syndromes. Then you have to have the control mechanisms, the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. And it all starts with diet. Now, diet might be the most difficult thing we have to do but it's also the most important. And when I started using these techniques, I would give people shopping lists of things to do. And of course, because the diet was difficult, people would cherry pick and do the easy things first, i.e., you know, take a few supplements or whatever. But it starts off with the diet. And the diet, again, whenever I have a difficult question, I always go back to evolutionary biology and nature and look at things from first principles. And we evolved over hundreds of thousands, nay, millions of years, eating a paleo ketogenic diet. That is the diet that is suited to our body. And there are two um, threads to this. First of all, paleo. Dairy products and gluten grains are appeared very recently in our evolution. Uh, only for the, the past few thousand years, which is which is a, nothing in terms of evolution. And the body simply can't deal with those um, foods efficiently. Dairy products are growth promoting. They have the wrong proportion of calcium to magnesium in them. Uh, they're pro-inflammatory. Da, 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 da. Gluten grains, again, um, they are very good at switching on the immune system. They're associated with many allergies and autoimmunity. So that's the first thread. The second thread is our mitochondria, the, the engines of our car, they like to run on ketones. And the point is, is that when we get energy from ketones, we produce very few free um, radical species. Whereas if we run our body on sugars and carbohydrates, it produces a lot of reactive oxygen species, a lot of free radicals. And free radicals are very damaging. Again, to use the car analogy, free radicals are the exhaust fumes of our car that have to be you know, taken away and got rid of safely. So, the fuel of our car is ketones, and we get ketones from fueling ourselves with fat and with fiber. So the paleoketogenic diet is rich in fiber, so lots of vegetables, nuts, seeds, and so on. Uh, it's a normal, it's not a high protein diet, normal protein, and then fat is such an important fuel. And the reason that we have so much chronic disease now is because um, in the 1980s, suddenly there was a switch from you know go to work on an egg. I was brought up on bacon and eggs for breakfast. Go to work and then suddenly, oh, oh no, it's got to be porridge, orange juice, muesli, cereals, 
a high carbohydrate diet. And that was the beginning of the end. Carbohydrates are highly addictive. We eat them in an addictive way. And once you get on that carbohydrate, you know, um, addiction process, as I call it, uh, people find it very difficult to, to, to not eat them. And Carbohydrates are pro-inflammatory that because they produce these oxygen-free radicals when you burn them, and they're very bad news for mitochondria. So that is absolutely the starting point. And you know, I could spend the whole of the next 30 minutes doing nothing but talking about the paleoketogenic diet. And if people simply put that in place, as I say to all my patients, just do it. If they just did that, that would be the starting point to reverse dementia. For example, um, Dale Bredesen, California, neurologist, 10 patients with dementia, reversed them completely with a ketogenic diet. One of them was mm -hmm. unable to stick to the regimes and she failed. Uh, heart failure. I learned this from cardiologists, Stephen Sinatra and Gabriela Segura. The starting point to treat heart failure is a ketogenic diet. Cancer. We know cancer is a metabolic disease. That was known in the 1930s. It's called the Warburg effect. And if we um, get, feed people on ketones, then cancer cells cannot thrive. They cannot flourish. So although in the short term, the ketogenic diet might seem like you know hard work, it's the starting point to treat chronic fatigue syndrome. And as you know, that's my area of special interest, but also to prevent and indeed reverse those three major pathologies, which are you know, the big causes of death in the modern world. May so, I ask you, Sarah, before you go on, May I ask you uh, about this paleo diet? Does it require uh, that one eats meat or can vegetarians have a paleo diet too? It's possible to be um, uh, paleo uh, on a vegetarian diet. And in fact, I have two or three vegan patients who can do a paleo diet and be vegan, but it's just more difficult. It just means the diet becomes more restricted, but it is perfectly possible. I, I just have to say I'm not an advocate of vegetarian and vegan diets. Um, you know, are human beings or have they ever been vegetarian or vegan in the in the evolutionary uh, past? No, they haven't. Um, you know, we've always been omnivores, but that aside, I know that being a vegetarian or a vegan is a major risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. Uh, and I mean, I, I've done mitochondrial function tests on now over uh, 1,036 patients. And I, when I tossed up the, the, the um, figures the other day, a third of them were vegetarian or vegan. So, um, and that is the, the clinical impression of my colleagues as well. So it's not a fine thing. I was going to say, I recently discovered uh, hemp seed which is amazingly nutritious. It's a high proportion of fat and protein and, and low carb and really delicious. It works uh, for me uh, as, as a couscous or something. So, uh, Well, I'm so pleased you say that because um, hemp oil, uh, our physiological requirements um, are for the essential fatty acids, omega-6 to omega-3 should be in the proportion four to one. And hemp oil has that almost that perfect equation. So I, I one of the things I recommend all my chronic fatigue syndrome patients do is have a good dessert spoonful of, of just raw hemp oil um, daily. And it's a, a very helpful addition to their diet. Oh, that's really, really interesting because I'm having at least a good dessert spoonful of hemp seeds. So. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, so once we've got, um, there's another reason why the uh, ketogenic diet is so important, because so much pathology is driven by the upper fermenting gut. Now, let me explain that again, back to nature, back to evolutionary principles. Humans are omnivores and we have a gut that reflects that. So the upper gut, by which I mean the stomach, duodenum, jejunum, small intestine, should be almost sterile. Uh, it's there for the business of digesting meats and fats. Um, and, the and, the, and the way we achieve that is by the stomach being extremely acidic. It's about pH two or three. And the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. So that is extremely acidic. And what that acid does is it kills any microbes that comes into the upper gut. And therefore, um, foods can be properly digested. Now, if you are eating many carbohydrates or sugars, you overwhelm the ability of the upper gut to sterilize, to acidify the upper gut. And uh, wherever there are sugars and carbohydrates, microbes move in because bacteria and yeast love sugars and carbohydrates. Bacteria and yeast cannot, cannot live on fats and fibers, but they can live on sugars and carbohydrates. 
So these microbes move into the upper gut and the upper gut starts to ferment instead of digest. And that brings it a whole host of problems. Firstly, if you are got a, a, an upper fermented gut, you have a leaky gut. And that means you cannot concentrate acid in the upper gut because the acid leaks out as fast as it's pumped in. And if you haven't got an acid upper gut, then you can't digest protein properly. You can't sterilize the upper gut, so it's a major route for infection. And you interfere with the emptying of the upper gut. And my view is that symptom of heartburn or reflux is almost pathognomonic of the upper fermenting gut. Secondly, um, if you are fermenting the upper gut, you produce all sorts of toxins. The one we all know about, of course, is alcohol. If you put yeast in the upper gut with some sugar, you will produce alcohol. It's called the auto brewery syndrome. And you can produce significant amounts of alcohol. My record score when I tested patients with this was one patient who produced 19 milligrams per litre of alcohol following a, a glucose load. Uh, and that's well, it's not quite drunk driving, but it's well on the way to drunk driving. <laughs> And we all know that alcohol, you know, if, if I had a glass of wine for breakfast, I wouldn't get any work done in the day. <laughs> but if you're constantly <laughs> fermenting, you know, it's not just ethyl alcohol, it's propyl alcohol, it's butyl alcohol, it's ammoniacal compounds, it's delactate, it's hydrogen sulfide. These are all directly toxic. Now, of course, what happens normally is the blood, the, the venous drainage of the gut all goes to the liver and the liver detoxifies those um, substances. But that requires a lot of energy. Again, another uh, fascinating figure at rest, um, although the brain weighs 2 percent, it burns 20 percent of all our um, energy in the body that's generated. The heart about 7 percent, the liver 27 percent. Massive amounts of energy are consumed in the liver for the for the purposes of detoxifying um, uh, stuff that comes through from the gut. So if you reduce that toxic load, that's a huge um, uh, benefit. And then, of course, you get toxins from the microbes themselves, because if you've got bacteria, you get bacterial endotoxin. If you've got fungi, you've got fun you have fungal mycotoxins. And we know those substances are very toxic indeed. So. The ketogenic diet, uh, the first thing it does, it reduces massively the toxic load of the body. And the third thing here um, um, is that these microbes drive pathology elsewhere in the body. So at medical school, we're taught, yes, yeah, there are lots of microbes in the, in the lower gut, but there they stay. We now know that's not true. We now know these microbes get into the bloodstream very easily. It's called bacterial translocation. Yeah. So you know, if, 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 if somebody brushed their teeth, you would you detect dental microbes in the bloodstream you know, a few minutes later. And these microbes get into the body and they get stuck at distal sites. And the immune system comes along and thinks, oh, I'm not familiar with that microbe. It shouldn't be here. And it drives inflammation. And my guess is that many pathologies like polymyalgia rheumatica, temporal arteritis, um, uh, inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, um, uh, Reiser syndrome, these are all driven by allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut. So, uh, so, so of course, therefore, what that tells us the gut is all uh, the diet is also implicated in inflammation. So we have the so it's this, the diet is central for good energy delivery mechanisms, and poor diet will diff, will drive many inflammatory conditions. So you know we're we're already addressing these two issues. So having got the right fuel in the tank, which has to be ketones. We can then look at the mitochondria. And as you know, this is my area of special interest. Uh, we published our first paper on this in 2009 in patients with fatigue syndromes. But I was very lucky to work with a brilliant biochemist, Dr. John McLaren Howard, who, and we were not only interested in how well the mitochondria work and their, their total overall function, but also why they were going slow. So Dr. John McLaren Howard was, was routinely measuring essential nutrients for our mitochondria to work, as well as look at looking at why they were going slow, i.e. the toxic stresses. And um, we learned much from Stephen Sinatra, a cardiologist, but essentially there are five nutrient deficiencies that come up time and time and time again in people with poor mitochondrial dysfunction. And the first is magnesium. And the bare minimum for mitochondrial function is 300 milligrams of elemental magnesium a day. And of course, you need vitamin D for its absorption. And guess what? Well, as you know, we are all deficient in vitamin D because we simply don't get enough sunshine. So 10,000 international units of vitamin D is essential for magnesium absorption. 
And then we need coenzyme Q10. That's one of the most important electron acceptors and donors in mitochondria. And in the fatigue syndrome patients I was looking at, almost invariably, they had very low levels of CoQ10. So CoQ10, 100 milligrams a day, great start. And of course, statins inhibit the body's endogenous production of coenzyme Q10. And that's why the, one of the commonest side effects of statin is muscle weakness, fatigue, and, and indeed often chest pain. Thirdly, we need vitamin B3. It's another important electron donor and acceptor within the mitochondria. Using the car analogy, it's like the oil in our engine. Coenzyme Q10 and, and uh, vitamin B3 reduce the biochemical friction in our mitochondria. And then acetyl L-carnitine. Uh, this acetyl L-carnitine, as the name implies, comes from meat. It's a three. It's a short-chain polypeptide, three amino acids, and I, and that's the fuel uh, nozzle by which we get our our, uh, our ketone fuel into mitochondria. It's called the carnitine sh shuttle. And my guess is this is one mechanism by which for vegans and vegetarians are at more risk of fatigue syndromes because almost invariably they have low levels of carnitine. And then, of course, we need the raw material to make the energy molecule, ATP, and that's D-ribose. Uh, it's a five-carbon sugar. Now, the body can make its own D-ribose, but it's a nasty bit of biochemistry called the pentose phosphate shunt, and it takes a lot of time. And what this means is it's very typical of people with fatigue syndromes to overdo things. The difference between normal fatigue and pathological fatigue is if you pay for your exertions the next day, that's pathological fatigue. If, you know, I shall have a busy day today, I'll have a good night's sleep and I'll wake up tomorrow being as right as rain. But if I burn the candle at both ends and, you know, ran a marathon and, and worked hard and stayed up all night, I would be tired tomorrow. That's pathological fatigue. And the mechanism of that is that We've used up all our ATP molecules to the extent that we've actually drained them out of the system. And we need D-ribose to make brand new de novo ATP. And D-ribose shortcuts that. From If you, if you provide the, the, the sugar D-ribose, you can make ATP pretty much instantly. So those are the raw materials we need for our mitochondria to, to function to good, good speed. But we then also have to look at blocking. What inhibits mitochondria? What makes them go slow? And of course, the most common thing, and we know this because John McLaren Howard developed um, uh, translocator protein studies to look at uh, how efficiently mitochondria were working. And from those studies, he could see what it was that was actually inhibiting them. And for many, it's a reactive oxygen species. Well, that's what happens when you have too much sugar and carbohydrates in the diet. That just the business of making energy creates reactive oxygen species. Products of the upper fermenting gut were major blockers of, of um, mitochondria. And you and I know that if I have a glass of wine, okay, I might feel temporarily very happy, but then I'm very tired after it. You know, alcohols, D-lactates, hydrogen sulfide, ammoniacal compounds, all these have the potential to inhibit mitochondria. In fact, patients often tell me when they sort out their fermenting gut, they suddenly say, my brain's better. My foggy brain is gone, you know, because they're not poisoning it anymore. And then, of course, there are the, um, uh, the environmental poisons like toxic metals, uh, pesticides, and one of the most widely used pesticides in the world today is glyphosate. It is chemically an organophosphate. The biochemical name by which we produce energy is, is um, um, oxidative phosphorylation, and organophosphates inhibit that. So very often some patients need detox regimes to get rid of these toxins. Oh, I was just talking to a, a fungal expert last night, and he points out that in his very sick patients, it's so often mycotoxins, uh, and they inhibit mitochondrial function directly. And of course, you can get viral proteins will inhibit mitochondrial function. So then say so we're looking at the, the inhibitors of. But once we've got the mitochondria in a fit state with the right fuel in the tank, i.e. ketones, the raw materials they need to function, the freedom from toxic stress, then we have to look at the control mechanisms. And, and that means the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. And the underactive thyroid um, is incredibly badly treated. It's underdiagnosed and it's mistreated. Even the endocrinologists will tell you that they reckon about 10% of the population have hypothyroidism, but only 1% are receiving um, a thyroid replacement therapy. Um, 
Dr. Um, uh, Kenneth Blanchard, endocrinologist from America, he reckons it's more like 30% of Westerners suffer from the underactive thyroid and would benefit from um, treatment with thyroid hormones. So uh, we then look at thyroid function. The most important feature of which is to make sure your patient is not overactive. Because the point here is that the blood test is what I call the coarse tuning and the how do you feel the fine tuning. So once you've got the diet in place, and some basic supplements so that the mitochondria are in a fit state to respond, we can then do a trial of thyroid hormones if we think that is clinically appropriate. And in parallel with that, very often these people have adrenal fatigue because um, they've exhausted their adrenal glands. They've run their lives on adrenaline, and I'm sure you're one of those tests. <laughs> um, you run your lives on adrenaline, and eventually the adrenal gland says, Pfft, had enough, can't do any more, and shuts down. And what that the, the clinical feature of that is people are markedly intolerant of stress. So they can't gear up in response to, to demand. So um, they have to plod everywhere. They can't speed up and run to do things. They can't get their brain in gear if, you know, uh, should um, uh, demands apply. So that's um, energy delivery mechanism. I hope I've made that clear um, uh, and makes sense. You're, you're a wonderful teacher and a wonderful doctor. I'm learning so much, and I just want to give you the floor and, and, and let you carry on. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, as I say, that is a clinical picture of chronic fatigue syndrome. It's often confused with ME. Now, they are similar diseases, but in ME, we have the poor energy delivery mechanisms but we also have inflammation. So ME is chronic fatigue syndrome plus inflammation. And so we then have to look at um, why is that person in an inflamed state? And inflammation is when the immune system is busy. And for listeners, our immune system is our standing army. And, you know, if you're living in a country, yep, we all need a standing army so that if somebody tries to invade our country, like an infection, that standing army can leap into action and repel. But if we have tourists coming into the country, country, you know, who are just having to look around and our standing army reacts against them, that's called allergy. And allergies to foods are common and allergies to inhalants and, and to our pets are common. And if our immune system is, you know, alerted in that event, then that's causing what I call a useless inflammation. So we've all seen people with hay fever, haven't we? Hay fever is allergy to um, grass pollen. But if you just look to person with, with those symptoms, you say, oh, they've obviously got an infection. They've obviously got a cold because they're sneezing, they're wheezing, they've got runny eyes, they're running at temperature, they're feeling ill. It's just an example of how when the immune system is inflamed, um, it can make us feel terrible. So always think allergy. And we've already addressed that, haven't we? Because the paleoketogenic diet, the, the big two allergens are gluten, grains and dairy products. So that's always a great start. Then we have to think about um, autoimmunity, and, uh, and that has the potential to cause any sort of inflammation in the body. But the big one is chronic infection. Now, at least a half, I would reckon, of the patients that I see with a post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome, it's Epstein-Barr virus. It's an extremely nasty little virus. And, and you know, 90% of the population will test positive for Epstein-Barr virus. Now, if you've got a cracking immune system, which is in good shape because it's got plenty of energy, we've talked about energy delivery mechanisms, and it's got raw materials like vitamin C, like zinc, like selenium that we need to fight infection, then we will get that infection, get rid of it, and it will remain at a low level in our bodies for life. But if for some reason we become immunosuppressed, immunosuppressed because of medications, uh, because of the pill or HRT, both of which are immunosuppressive, um, um, because of poor energy delivery mechanisms, then that nasty little virus will rear its nasty little ugly head and make us ill. And I learned so much from the work of Dr. Martin Lerner, American physician, who himself had a cardiomyopathy. And he treated and cured his cardiomyopathy with valacyclovir, which is a drug which is very effective against the herpes viruses. And then he started looking at some of his patients and thought, clinically, they look exactly the same as I do. I wonder if they've got you know, um, uh, ME as well, driven by Epstein-Barr virus. Published four studies looking at the use of valacyclovir antivirals in the treatment of these patients. Very good results. 
And many of my patients with um, chronic Epstein-Barr virus infection, and we can now test for that, either by doing Ellis spot tests at Armin Laboratories in Germany, or by maybe looking at antibody teeters, give them valacyclovir, and they often see marked improvements with that. But it's not just Epstein-Barr virus infection, is it? It's also Lyme disease. It's also mycoplasma. It's also chronic fungal infection. But of course, the elephant in the room at the moment is the wretched COVID. And we are seeing uh, many cases of long COVID, which is ME, triggered by a, acute COVID infection. And we're also seeing long COVID triggered by the mRNA vaccines, because um, what both these um, pathologies do is they introduce spike protein into the body. And spike protein is markedly pro-inflammatory. And so the big clinical question that's facing many doctors like myself and yourself at present is, how does the body get rid of spike protein? And the answer is we don't really know. We can put in place all things anti-inflammatory, Yes, we know drugs like ivermectin are very good at getting rid of the virus itself, but that still leaves us with the spike protein, especially after an mRNA vaccine. And um, uh, uh, ivermectin is well worth trying for some patients with, with long COVID. But there's a paper came out in the summer produced by Paul Marek suggesting that the only way or one way we can get rid of spike protein is by autophagy, self eating, autophagy as it's pronounced. And that is switched on uh, by fasting. And so this is a, a new intervention that I'm trying for some of my patients now. We're trying intermittent fasting um, to try to help and get rid of it, to eat up the, the spike protein that's circulating in their body, again with mixed results. So we don't know all the answers, that's for sure. But if we can understand the mechanisms, then when a biologically plausible solution appears on the horizon, um, I can invite my patient to be guinea pigs and, and bless them. They're very um, uh, uh, good at accepting that role. And you say, well, let's try this. This makes sense. Let's see what helps. So ME is always difficult. I reckon with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, I've got most of the answers. That's usually fairly straightforward to sort out. But turning the immune system off, dealing with that chronic infection, that is the next big challenge. Mm. And do you think I, when you're listing all those different sorts of infections, I wondered about parasitic infections. Do you think we might have chronic parasitic infections we don't know or haven't uh, even um, identified yet? Yeah, that's certainly possible. Um, but again, it's all about the gut. Uh, I mean, um, uh, because when you say parasites, I presume you mean parasites within the gut, in, within the gut like blastocysts, harmless cryptosporidia, um, uh, maybe um, worm infections or whatever. Yes, that is a possibility. The tests are very good. But I can see people who are, who are completely fit and well who have got blastocystis hominis, who have got uh, cryptosporidia on board, or who have got um, entamoeba uh, um, coli, E. coli on board, or, or, or um, um, uh, you know, other such parasites, and they're completely well. And I think it's all about how well the gut deals with this. And that is all about how well the microbiome is functioning. Now, again, the microbiome has profound effects on our health. Um, there's a fascinating paper produced by Thomas Borody. He runs the Centre for Digestive Diseases in Sydney in Australia. Um, and uh, it was he and Barry uh, Marshall who discovered Helicobacter pylori in the 1980s. So he's been involved with gut um, microbes for, for decades. And he took a group of patients with chronic fatigue syndromes and an ME. He didn't differentiate 60 of them. And he treated them with fecal bacteria therapy. So essentially, um, he replaced their normal bi microbiome with a donation from a healthy donor. And what was so interesting is that 70% of them saw benefits from that single intervention, which is which is riveting. Um, and then I can so, so sorting out the microbiome is very important. And our microbiomes are under assault. They are under assault for many reasons. First of all, we are not consuming evolutionarily correct diets. We are, you know, so many people rely on, on fast carbohydrates, refined foods, which have got very low levels of fiber in them, and therefore we are not feeding our microbiome. And the other problem is that 54% of the microbes in the large bowel are sensitive to glyphosate. They are killed by glyphosate. 
And we don't know much about the microbiome, but what we do know is that the more diverse it is, the more, the greater the number of different species we have, the healthier we are. Now, if you knock off 54% of that with glyphosate, then, you know, my interpretation of we're going to be 54% less healthy. You know, the microbiome is, is a very important part of our gut. And I think there has never been a more important time to eat as organically as is possible. I know in the modern world, it's impossible to be completely organic, but do the very best that you can do. Yes, I mean, organic is much more expensive than uh, than uh, regular, uh, well, it's not just fruit and veg, but especially the other products, the dried products and that. And so uh, it, one, it's, it's easy to understand why people hesitate, but I totally agree with you. One just has to do it. One has to go organic and uh, and cut back on the other things that you're doing uh, if you're eating meals out or, or getting takeaways or whatever, just cut back on that and put the money rather into really healthy organic food. Uh, I know, I know. Mm. Just on the subject of the microbiome, uh, Dr. Sabine Hazan works with Professor Brody in Australia. She's based in the States and she has her own lab and does um, studies of the microbiome. And uh, she's also done a lot of studies looking at ivermectin, uh, the effect of ivermectin on the microbiome, as well as on the, uh, as well as these uh, these novel vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, and so on. And what she's shown is that um, the, uh, the ivermectin improves bifida bacteria in the gut, uh, and so it has a positive effect on the microbiome. She does say though that uh, obviously, if you it has such a positive effect, you actually wouldn't want to take it long term. Uh, because it might have one have bifida, uh, bifida bacteria overgrowing, and then you know to the at the expense of the others. But anyway, so that might be another mechanism as to why it improves health um, in in uh, chronic illness. Uh, but um, the other thing is what she has said with regard to these new vaccines is that they reduce the um, the flora of the of the microbiome, the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And she said, so, 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 you know, from what I understand, you know, we need to really be looking at um, keeping the, the gut microbiome, restoring it among people who've been vaccinated. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's absolutely fascinating. I didn't know either of those two things. So thank you for that, Tess. But it makes perfect sense. Um, we, we know ivermectin is an extremely benign drug. Um, it's very well tolerated. It's been used for decades in animals and humans with with, with minimal side effects and, and, and huge potential to do good. In fact, there used to be a doctor um, who had better be nameless because he was persecuted by the General Medical Council for prescribing ivermectin. Um, who was often using ivermectin in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME and getting good results clinically. And I was chatting away with him and I said to him, what's the mechanism by which ivermectin is helpful? And he said, well, I'm not really sure. It might do this and it might do that. But the bottom line is the patients often do well with it. And you know, sometimes, especially at the cutting edge of clinical medicine, we don't know all the mechanisms, but we just know from clinical experience that this is effective. And guess what? The patients don't mind that. Now, if you're if you know and I explained to my patients that you know you might be guinea pig number one or two or three here, but you know it's intrinsically safe. This is how we think it works, you know, it's it makes it's it's biologically plausible, and they're very happy to give it a go because they're desperate to restore their health, understandably. Well, one can see actually that um um you know, have it down the line, it might be necessary. And indeed, of, uh, of great utility to have um, labor uh, or uh, banks of uh, of fecal bacteria. Um, maybe it's already uh, already happening, but just like one has blood banks, one has blank banks of fecal bacteria to help restore um, the the natural microbiome. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's ex it's a very good idea and uh, and needs to be pursued. I mean, the the problem with probiotics. Or rather, with the problem with the microbiome is it's very oxygen sensitive, and this is why there isn't a probiotic on the market that will restore our microbiome because they, you know, as soon as it's exposed to oxygen, many of these microbes die. So any such a bank would have to be anaerobic and maybe, you know, um, uh, very cold in order to keep these microbes in a in a live state. But 
Fecal bacterial therapy does work fantastically well, but it's got a major yuck factor attached to it. You know, people don't like the idea of fecal bacterial therapy, you know, it's um, uh, for, for very obvious reasons. So, yes, if that could be evolved and and and, and these microbes, these safe microbes re- retained in an anaerobic environment for people to use either as suppositories or whatever, then that would be a huge step forward. And I would greatly support that. Mm. Uh, well, so we've covered um, we've covered gut and diet uh, and information. Is there anything else people can do that's not um, dietary related uh, to restore good health? Oh, a huge, huge amounts. I mean, the first thing is um, um, in the early stages of this wretched illness, you must pace activity. Uh, and so often people, they start to get fatigued and they think they can run it off. They work harder, it will disappear. And that almost invariably makes things worse. So pacing activity is re- very important. Another fabulous tool I love to use is far infrared. Um, the best form of getting far infrared, of course, is sunshine and sunbathing. But of course, we can't get that in these cloudy days. And, th- and therefore, far infrared saunas, far infrared jackets, far infrared sleeping bags. Very helpful because um, far infrared penetrates the flesh. And it improves the uh, um, blood flow enormously and it improves mitochondrial function. And I think the mechanism of that has to do with the fourth phase of water, another one of my favorite um, uh, subjects. So uh, far infrared, fantastically useful. It's It also helps to multi, it's a multitasking tool because it also helps us to detoxify. And then the two micronutrients I love to use in everybody are vitamin C and iodine because they're an essential part of cleaning the upper fermenting gut. uh, And vitamin C is probably the most important antioxidant in the body. So vitamin C, five grams a day. Iodine, Lugol's iodine, 15 percent, three drops last thing at night. Uh, Those two interventions are incredibly helpful. I'm always looking for what I call um, multitasking tools which are intrinsically safe, cheap, available to everybody um, that help the body in many different ways. And those two will be the top of my list. It's such such wonderful advice. And we really are uh, trying to encourage people to take responsibility, take control of their own health. So I hope people are taking notes. And uh, certainly in our Substack article, we'll make sure we've uh, noted down these these um, these uh, supplements and things that you, you recommend. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that we're we're almost out of time. And it feels like we've only just touched the surface and I'd like to get you back to speak about um, about water. <laughs> love to walk about there. I could love to talk. I talk all day about water. Uh, once you get me going, you can't stop me. <laughs> well, give us a little taste. Give us a few minutes of water. Tell us about the importance and, and, and what you know. Um, well, you know, the human body is, 90%, uh, is 70% composed of water. But what's so fascinating about this water is it's not water as a liquid water that we know about. It's called it's it's the fourth phase of water. It's called exclusion zone water. So we know water exists as a liquid water as a solid. It's called ice as a gas. It's called steam. But exclusion zone water is what water molecules do when they line themselves up against the surface. And of course, we are comprised of. Of, of hundreds of square kilometers of membrane in the body. And against cell membranes, which would be the lining of a blood vessel, which would be blood cells themselves, which would be against mitochondria, water aligns itself in a honeycomb shape. And that honeycomb shape um, uh, against um, um, uh, a surface excludes um, protons. So the water itself becomes negatively charged, but immediately against it, you then have a positive layer, i.e. you've got an electrical gradient. And that electrical gradient across cell membranes, across mitochondrial membranes, is what drives circulation and what drives energy delivery mechanisms. And for that to happen, yes, you've got to have good quality water there, but you also have to have background heat. And that comes into us in the form of far infrared. We actually generate far infrared in our muscles, just the business of being warm. You know, I'm exuding far infrared heat. Um, uh, And that with those two uh, things in place, good quality cell membranes, which requires fat, of course, good water and far infrared, that reduces the friction in the system. It allows blood to circulate. I just read a fascinating book recently by a cardiologist called Hussey, who points out that the heart is only responsible for about 40% of the circulation. You know, we imagine the heart pumps blood around the whole of the body. It doesn't. And of course, how does venous blood return to the heart? There's no heart there that's pumping it along. And it happens 
thanks to this electrical a technique, electrical um, effects of um, uh, that the line all cell membranes. So if you think about it, if all the lining of blood vessels is all negatively charged and all cells are negatively charged, then that's going to have the effect of forcing the blood um, from um, a layer of, of where it's uh, where the um, arteries, where the veins are narrowed to where they're more open. And studies done in, in, in dogs, they stop the heart and the blood continues to flow for whilst the animal is warm. It will flow for hours, even though the animal that that heart is no longer pumping. It just shows the power of um, uh, of water, um, appropriately charged fourth phase water, exclusion zone water, to allow circulation. I think, you know, what you're describing also just reminds me about the whole area of biology you've totally ignored, and that is the fact that we are electrical beings, you know, we are electromagnetic, and 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 it's we, we, we've kind of been, been pigeonholed into, into chemistry, we're always looking at the chemistry of, of what's going on in the body, and yes. and uh, electricity is much likely, electrical electromagnetic aspects of us, much likely to be able to explain how we work than, than purely chemistry. And so uh, it's wonderful learning about water. We have to learn more about water and more about how um, uh, how the body works. We certainly don't know it and there's no consensus on it. We still don't know how we think and why one person has one thought and another person has another. And that's most likely, I would think, related to uh, to uh, electromagnetism than chemistry. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but such a fascinating conversation. I hope we can have you back again um, and, uh, and talk more. But thank you so much, Dr. Myhill. Thank you so much for, for um, being on Test Talks today. My absolute pleasure, Tess.